Welcome to Gracefully Graying. I'm your host, Attorney Henry Gornbine. Today on Gracefully Graying, I am very pleased to welcome as my guest, Dr. Michael Paletta, who is a Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Hospice of Michigan and Arbor Hospice, founding members of the North Star Care community. Dr. Paletta, welcome to Gracefully Graying. Thank you. And I, I suppose that it's uh, also true that I am uh, gracefully graying myself, as people can see. And so I, I feel like I'm in the right place. Good. Well, we're pleased to have you. First of all, Dr. Paletta, tell us about your role with the North Star Care Community. Okay. Uh, well, let me just say for folks to, to set the context, uh, North Star Care Community is a, a group of uh, brand organizations that provide palliative care and end-of-life care uh, throughout the lower peninsula of Michigan. We, we're not in the UP, so we can't say statewide, uh, yet we cover most of the mitten, and our, the brands that people know are Hospice of Michigan and Arbor Hospice. So uh, in this town, we, we think in automotive terms, so if you think of North Star as like General Motors, and then within GM, of course, you have Cadillac, Chevrolet, Buick, GMC truck. And people know that those are separate brands with separate identities, but they're all part of GM. And in the same way, we have Hospice of Michigan, Arbor Hospice. We have the Joella Nyman Anchors Pediatric Palliative Care Program. And we have the North Star Institute, which is a teaching and training and North Star Palliative Care. But all, So all of those are part of North Star and it's just a way for us to brand our end-of-life care uh, and identify the different aspects of our company. You are a medical doctor and also have the designation of FAAHPM. Tell us about that. Well, you know, all uh, medical specialties have their professional society, American College of Surgeons, uh, American College of Physicians. So I am a fellow of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, those are uh, physicians and others from around the country, uh, some in academics, some in clinical practice, uh, all uh, together interested in improving and promoting end-of-life care, uh, palliative care and hospice. Uh, and so uh, some years ago, I was uh, elected as a fellow of that group. Dr. Paletto, what is the history of Hospice of Michigan, Arbor Hospice, and the North Star Care Community? I'm covering all the entities, I guess, but tell us about the history. Well, Hospice of Michigan and Arbor have both been around since the early 1980s. So when hospice care first began to take hold in the U.S. in the early 80s and became part of the Medicare benefit, which meant now there was a not only official sanction for end-of-life care as part of Medicare, but also money available to grow programs and also to support a research uh, infrastructure into uh, better practices and end-of-life care. And, and HOM and Arbor have both been around uh, since that time, uh, most of it as competitors. Uh, now, a lot of people think that hospice is like the post office. It's all the same organization, and there's just a branch in every town. In reality, uh, Michigan has about 120 different licensed hospice providers, and they all compete with each other for business. And so uh, Arbor and Hospice of Michigan were competitors for many years. Um, and uh, over time, uh, it just became, um, it became advantageous to discuss affiliation. And, and rather than a, a competitive relationship, particularly in Southeast Michigan, uh, we decided on a cooperative one and then came together at a, at a corporate level. Uh, but we still have over 100 competitors around the state. Uh, and so by coming together and forming the North Star entity, which was formed in 2017, it allows us to be more competitive in what is a very uh, cutthroat industry um, throughout the state. And also it allows us to it allows us to strengthen the not-for-profit hospice brand. Now, Arbor and Hospice of Michigan are both not-for-profit 501c3 corporations. We have uh, boards of community volunteers uh, in our governance, and uh, we have a tax status 
as uh, a nonprofit, uh, which means that all of the additional dollars that we have when care is dispersed go back into the company to pay for other services for patients and families. That is in distinction to the vast majority of programs in Michigan that are for-profit companies, uh, many headquartered outside the state, who are either uh, privately owned or have uh, shareholders, or and some are even publicly traded, where end-of-life care is the way in which they make money for their stakeholders. Uh, and so we draw a distinction between a for-profit hospice company and a not-for-profit, and it's not just about the tax status, it's about the mission of the organization, the priorities, the services that are offered. Um, and so uh, Hospice of Michigan and Arbor, by coming together, uh, strengthened the organization, allowed us to compete with for-profit entities. Tell us about some of the services that are provided by the North Star Care community. So because we are a, a Medicare uh, sanctioned provider, we comply with all of the Medicare requirements for end of life care under the hospice benefit. So um, nursing care, uh, the care of hospice aides, you know, personal uh, attendants who come in and help patients with uh, bathing and grooming and dressing and some wound care sometimes. Uh, social work, uh, not only for counseling, but also for assistance with insurance uh, and uh, healthcare paperwork issues. We have a large cohort of volunteers throughout the state who, who donate their time to help patients and families and help the organization. We have grief support and spiritual care uh, of all denominations and all faith traditions to help people struggling with those types of issues at the end of life. Of course, we have physician specialists who are uh, experts in pain management and in managing distressing symptoms at the end of life. All of our teams have a board certified physician uh, as the advisor. So those are services that are required by uh, Medicare. And so all licensed hospice providers must provide them. But there are still differences in ways from one hospice to the next in how often an aide may come to the home, how often nursing visits occur, what kind of medical treatments are available to patients on hospice. Can people on hospice continue things like dialysis or radiation treatments or chemotherapy or transfusions? Uh, there are great differences from one hospice to the next uh, on whether those services are available. The quality of the counseling and bereavement, you know, for the surviving family after a death, we provide up to a year of bereavement services. Uh, not all hospices are, are, are doing that. So, so, you know, for the consumer, for the person considering end-of-life care, um, that's a place to be uh, a, a good consumer, a researcher, do your homework, go online, uh, find out about the programs that are being recommended or the programs that are operating in your area because there are many differences. Michael, tell us about some of your teams. First of all, you have physicians. Tell us a little bit about their role. Well, the, our, our physicians are specialists in hospice and palliative medicine. That's their area of training. It's what they do. Uh, now, some of them come from various backgrounds. Uh, I came from a background of geriatric and internal medicine, uh, but we have physicians who were uh, pediatricians, family medicine, anesthesia. Uh, and so the, the, whatever their foundational training, doctors make the choice to specialize in end-of-life care and really become experienced and, and savvy managing pain, managing other distressing symptoms, understanding how people with advanced illness, you know, require uh, comfort care uh, when the, the opportunity for a cure is no longer there, uh, that there are many interventions and treatments that can still diminish suffering and help people. Uh, and, and our docs specifically do that work. Um, and so they're, they're not, uh, you know, dabblers or, uh, you know, distant consultants. Our, our physicians visit patients in their homes, uh, in the facilities and hospitals, uh, and they really drive the care plan. What about hospice physical nurses? Uh, the, uh, the registered nurses, we have both uh, 
uh, RN case managers who are the nurses that manage patients um, and, and they, they become the point person for the family in terms of the care. They visit the patient frequently, uh, they get to know the family, they get to know the situation. Those are registered nurses. We also have nurse practitioners who have advanced nursing training who are, um, who are uh, physician extenders. So, you know, the, the doctors can only see so many people uh, in, in time. The nurse practitioners can also visit patients in their homes and facilities and provide that bridge and also provide much of the palliative care uh, that's done in addition to hospice. So uh, we also have in our contact center, in other words, when people uh, pick up the phone and call our 888 number, they're talking to a registered nurse who is trained in hospice, who has access to the medical records and can advise our existing patients on uh, <clears throat> a problem that may be occurring uh, even after hours or on weekends, or for people who call us and are seeking information, those nurses can uh, assist them if, um, if enrollment in hospice is their goal or provide information if they just have questions. So that, that's some of the different ways in which we use registered nurses. Tell us about the role of spiritual counselors. So our, our spiritual care and our grief support counselors uh, together as part of our counseling aim um, you know, many people as they're approaching the end of life, even if they've been a member of a church or a congregation, uh, they may have questions, they may have doubts. It, it helps them to have uh, someone who understands those struggles to, to talk to. Uh, many people that have not been particularly religious or had a spiritual focus for their lives, when they're faced with the end of that life, they may be seeking and asking questions of a spiritual nature. And so our folks are trained to anticipate and handle those types of issues for patients and for family members uh, and be uh, complementary to the priest or the rabbi or the minister or the imam or whoever the, uh, the faith advisor has been up to that point. And so they work hand in hand with those folks. Uh, the grief support are a particular, uh, a particular type of counseling where after the death has occurred. The family and close friends are now grieving the loss, and, and some people really struggle with the loss of a spouse or a child or a parent, uh, and as the weeks and months go by and they try to get back to their regular lives, they're still troubled with complicated grief issues. Our folks remain in contact with them, uh, sometimes in person, uh, sometimes by phone or by other uh, means. And, and we help guide them through that process. And if they need uh, specialty care, behavioral health or mental health or other types of counseling, our folks can be the liaison to uh, set them up with such things in their community. Jeff kind of believes that it takes at least a year for some type of healing for the simple reason that you have to go through a full cycle of events such as anniversaries, birthdays, holidays, and these are all painful reminders, but you have to get through that one year cycle after someone has passed away. <laughs> that is absolutely true. And, and there's actually been a fair amount of literature on studying that, uh, you know, in the mental health arena. And uh, uh, it really helps to have professional bereavement counseling available. And, you know, the irony is that we may have folks who, they were only on, they were a late referral to us. They were only received hospice services for a number of days, yet we will give them a full year of bereavement. So they're in the bereavement program far longer than their loved one was ever in hospice. And we even care for bereaved persons in the community who did not use Arbor or Hospice of Michigan. Uh, they may not have had hospice services at all, or they may have used one of our competitors. However, uh, as a community-based nonprofit, part of our mission is to take care of everyone who approaches. And so we provide grief support to them. Uh, and that's all fine. That's as it should be. Well, you also have a volunteer program. Tell us about that. We have professional volunteer managers who help us uh, train and then uh, maintain work schedules for people in the community who, for their own reasons, uh, would like to volunteer their time to assist patients and families uh, facing a life-limiting illness. Now, they may have had hospice services for a loved one 
themselves, or they may be members of a faith community that does this work, or just an individual who's looking for a service need in the community and says, hey, those are things that I can do. Uh, I, can, I can help with yard work, or I can sit with a patient and, and play cards and provide some companionship so that wife can get to the grocery store and the bank and do other things. Uh, and so our volunteers, or they may help in the office, preparing mailings, making phone calls, other things to help the hospice team. So the, the volunteers are a great way for us uh, as a large company to maintain the small company feel because they're connected in their own communities. And, and they, so as we, we look at our teams in, uh, in Big Rapids, in Cadillac, in Gaylord, in Alpena, our volunteers in those communities really help us stay grounded with what people there need. Um, and they provide a terrific service and, and they really stretch what we can do with a Medicare dollar in terms of providing value to a family. Dr. Pilato, before the show, I was looking through your website and I read that you have care for more than 5,100 patients in 47 counties across the lower peninsula last year. Is that still true now under COVID-19? I mean, have the numbers risen or tell us about it the- It is. Uh, you know, the, the number has risen uh, somewhat. I, I would say at any given day, we care for approximately 1,100 people around the state in our hospice, our palliative care, and our pediatric programs. Uh, and, and that remains true. As I said, uh, we cover most of the populated areas in the mitten. So we have rural and suburban and urban populations on our different teams. Um, the COVID situation uh, has had a great impact on our ability to visit patients where they are because that, that hands-on bedside care is such a big part of what hospice provides. And of course, in, in pandemic, we've not been able to do that as much. Uh, we're still doing it, uh, you know, and that's why we have gowns and gloves and masks and face shields and uh, we do screening and temperature checks. But, you know, there are some aspects of medical care that you still need to go to the bedside. And so even though it may resemble something out of a science fiction movie, uh, our folks are still going into the homes, still going into the facilities, still providing that care, although we are now making much greater use of video connections. Now, we're talking today on a Zoom-type uh, profile, but right. there are uh, FaceTime and Skype and Zoom and other platforms, and we are using all of those around the state, uh, and we've actually uh, pro approached some donors, and some donors have approached us and said, we will provide iPads, we'll provide Android devices to you that you can give to a family or loan to them so that you can have a video two-way hookup and serve that family in the same way that we're looking at each other today, have those conversations, allow us to uh, have the occasional in-person visit, but also maintain regular contact through a Zoom or a Skype. And uh, it's been very well received, even by some of our older folks who may not, uh, you know, guys like you and I didn't grow right. up with computers. Uh, and, and we may not be as tech savvy as our children and certainly our grandchildren. And yet when the need is there and the equipment is provided, our patients have really embraced the virtual visit. And so we, we're doing thousands of those now around the state in addition to that hands-on care. And, and it's been very successful. What's interesting, it's like the future has been sped up because of the pandemic and I interviewed the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court recently, Justice Bridget McCormick, and a year ago that they, they had the prescience to have Zoom licensing for every court in Michigan. So the courts are now operating under Zoom, and later this morning I'm going to be interviewing one of the judges in Oakland County as to how Zoom works in jury trials. I don't think it does. It does in many respects. And in healthcare, you have telemedicine becoming more and more important. So uh, computers, uh, FaceTime, uh, Zoom, and all these other corollaries are really becoming, uh, the futures have been sped up in many respects because of that, I think. Let me ask you a couple of other things. 
who can receive hospice care? Because in some of my interviews over the years that I've been doing Gracefully Growing, I've learned that people often come into hospice care and then because their meds are reduced or because they're in a nice, peaceful setting, they get better and they can be in and out. So tell us more about this, Dr. Pilar. Sure. So the, the hospice benefit is intended for any person of any age uh, who has a medical condition that despite aggressive treatment with our, what all of the things that our, our medical infrastructure brings to bear, surgery and medication and all the things that we know how to do now, despite all of those treatments, the person is continuing to get worse. Now, it may be from uh, an advanced cancer. It may be from some other type of organ damage like heart failure, uh, COPD or emphysema, kidney failure, liver failure, the, the afflictions that, uh, you know, all human beings uh, carry that risk. And many people, when the illness is no longer responding to the treatments or the cancer is so far advanced that the doctors are saying there's really not much benefit in trying to go after this thing, that's where hospice picks up. And so it, um, unfortunately, because we have so many medical options available to us, people will pursue continuing medical treatment despite lack of improvement. And they're getting worse and worse and worse. They're eligible for hospice care, but they want to try one more thing or they uh, try one more doctor or one more treatment. And so they come to hospice very late. And that, of course, is, you know, each individual has to make that decision for themselves. But when people come to hospice late, then it limits the amount of benefit that we can bring. When persons come earlier, that is, uh, when the illness is not responding to treatment, but the people are still reasonably functional and they can make their own decisions, they're clear-headed, um, they and their families can receive a lot of benefit from the nurses, the doctors, the spiritual care, the grief support, the volunteers, the aides, all of the services that we can bring to bear. And, and there's no real limit on how long someone can be on the program. Now, one of those misconceptions that I referenced earlier is people believe, oh, hospice, well, that's only for cancer. When any illness that is threatening a life expectancy is eligible. Or, well, hospice is just for the final days. Well, uh, there are many people who wait until their final days, but as I suggested, the real benefit of hospice comes when people are on the program for weeks or even months. And they say, oh, well, you have to die in six months if you come to hospice. Well, of course, there's no requirement that anyone die in any particular time frame. What the doctors are asked to say is, if this illness proceeds the way we think it may, it's reasonable to expect death in the next six months. That's the only statement that's made. And if the patient survive, does well and survives longer than six months, everyone's pleased. And they, right. don't, and they don't need to come off hospice. Uh, when, uh, in the situation that you opened with, people actually get better uh, because of the extra attention they receive in hospice care, then the physicians reevaluate the medical situation if they say, you know, in January, I thought Mrs. Jones looked pretty grim and hospice seemed to be the right thing to do. But now it's August and she's doing really well. She's eating again. She's playing cards. She's visiting the grandchildren. I don't think that in the next six months uh, are going to be gloomy for her. In that situation, hospice is not appropriate, and we would discharge her back to her regular doctor until such future time when things look grim again, and she could uh, once more elect hospice. So it is true that people can come on hospice. If they improve, they can come off, and then they can come back on again in the future. What I, uh, I think that not, not just in Michigan, but the national statistic is about somewhere between 13 and 15 percent of people on a hospice program will be discharged alive because they no longer meet the eligibility, which uh, uh, is, is a celebration. I mean, uh, 
Uh, most, most people would be pleased to know that they're not in a limited life expectancy situation. Are there averages as to how long someone is in hospice? Well, that, that depends on a lot of factors. Uh, and, that you know, the, the median length of stay is probably somewhere around three weeks. Uh, but d- based on diagnosis, obviously, you know, patients with advanced heart or kidney or lung disease will not le- survive as long. Uh, patients with other types of illnesses may survive longer on hospice. So it's really hard to put a number on that. Um, you know, pe- People tend to uh, tend to come to hospice late, uh, and so that skews the numbers. Uh, we we have median uh, and average lengths of stay that we use for our own internal accounting, but you know, for for people in the public or even for referring physicians, you know, th- those are not useful numbers. Really, the the well, issue that people would ask themselves is, am, am, with all of the medical care that I'm receiving, am I getting better and improving, or am I continuing to get worse? And is it reasonable to say that sometime between, well, it would be now, now and uh, Valentine's Day, is there a chance that I may lose this fight? And if the answer is yes, then they would be eligible for the benefit. Why are Hospice of Michigan and Arbor Hospice unique? And we're down to about a minute and a half. I just want to alert oh, you. Sure. Well, again, uh, I, you know, we are the strongest of the, uh, and the largest of the not-for-profit independent programs, independent meaning we work with all hospitals, all nursing homes, you know, all physicians around the state. Um, We have a very aggressive development and philanthropy and fundraising support from the community so we can provide a lot of services that uh, our for-profit competitors or smaller not-for-profits just can't afford to provide music therapy, massage therapy, uh, a pet program, uh, extensive uh, training and education services, the iPad program uh, are all examples of additional benefits that we have because of our aggressive development and fundraising. And so uh, those are among the, uh, the things that make Arbor and Hospice of Michigan unique in the market. What about costs to those who become patients or participants under hospice? There's never any cost for any service that hospice provides, even those additional benefits that I just mentioned. What does happen if patients receive their hospice care in a nursing facility, uh, the facility themselves may have a room and board charge that is not covered by Medicare as part of the benefit. So families will sometimes misinterpret a room and board charge uh, as coming from the hospice. But in truth, uh, by law, there are never charges for any services a licensed hospice provider will, uh, will bring to a patient family. Dr. Paletta, uh, we're out of time. I'm just being signaled. So I'm hearing I'm that. Sure to, wonderful. I'm not sure how to do this. I think I shut it down. I want to thank you so much for being my guest on Gracefully Grain. I'd like to continue this conversation on another date. And I want to thank our viewers for watching Gracefully Grain. Please don't hesitate to watch this video on our Gracefully Growing YouTube channel. And of course, visit our site, gracefullygrowing.com. Thank you again, Dr. Paletta. Henry, it's been my pleasure. I'd love to come back sometime. Absolutely. Thank you.